I was the wrong fit for him. He wanted someone to do what he couldn't do and give the information forcefully about how to make the car better. And I didn't do that because I was so enamored by the fact that I was driving for Lotus. My guest this week was both a Formula One driver and a team owner. He was hugely quick behind the wheel. And then after hanging up his race gloves, he set up his own Grand Prix team, Arrows. The man I'm talking about is, of course, Jackie Oliver. Welcome, everyone, to Be On The Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Jackie's Formula One journey started in the worst possible circumstances because he had the unenviable task of replacing the great Jim Clark at Lotus after the Scotsman had been killed at Hockenheim in 1968. He was quick from the outset and he would have won that year's British Grand Prix had it not been for a mechanical problem. In all, Jackie started 50 Grand Prix for Lotus, BRM, McLaren and Shadow, and he took a couple of podiums. Then, in part two of his Formula One career with Arrows, he scored nine podiums. And who can forget the most recent of those, Hungary 1997, when Damon Hill came within three laps of winning the race. Jackie remembers it as if it were yesterday. He also gives a fascinating insight into life as a driver in the 60s and what he learned from Colin Chapman that would help him at Arrows a decade later. And the dramas in those early months with Arrows, you won't believe what he had to go through to get his team to its first Grand Prix in 1978. Jackie is a fascinating man and he tells a good story. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Jackie, it is lovely to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. First question, when you look back at your career, do you see yourself as a racing driver or a team owner? I'm quite often uh, that question. The the question I get uh, from fan clubs, apart from photographs that come through the internet, is they say, Jackie, you've had four careers. And I said, no. Well, we're, we're now talking to classic racing. I said, classic car racing, cost me money, it's a hobby. It's not a career. He said, well, what are the three careers? And I said, well, I was a race driver, right? and I used to drive the cars, and then I started the team and had other people drive for me. And then I was non-executive chairman and director at Silverstone, managing the stage. So race driver, team owner, stage manager. So... Uh, it's all progression downwards. <laughs> so um, I, did, I, I, I did all three and enjoyed all three. I had a natural skill for the first and I had to be a quick learner for the second and third. <laughs> what gave you the most pleasure, inside the cockpit or outside? Well, pleasure is driven by the desire in which to try and participate and succeed. As a race driver, it was great pleasure because... I had a natural ability that seemed to apply. I would have hoped to have been more successful in Formula One, so that's a disappointment. But looking back, there are reasons why. Being a team owner, and for the first time when I started my team to sit in a Formula One constructors meeting with people that I used to drive for, I wanted to drive for, was a surreal experience, to be quite honest with you. But it was a different skill set, and again, I had to learn things unlearn things about being a driver and in the end I got the hang of it but interestingly enough as a team owner I was no more successful or unsuccessful than I was as a driver so whether that you're born with that DNA of not being the best but being able to hang on and survive I suppose is something I can reflect on. Which do you think you were better at driving or being a team boss? Well I was good at both of them because I survived in both. Both took a degree of luck, personal injury or death in the first, and being financially barren and poor in the second. (laughs) Because running a Formula One team was a crazy business that consumed money faster than you could make it. But I survived both, uh, Tom, so um, I really don't know whether I was any good at them, but I survived them. Which was more stressful? Well, funnily enough, the team ownership. 
because it was constant. Being a race driver, not that death or injury ever bothered me, because if it had have done, you should stop. But looking back, the people around me were concerned, and I wasn't, and that became a stress in its end. And as a result, it was one of the reasons I stopped. Let's look in more detail at the driving now. You took over Jim Clark's Lotus 49 after he was killed in 1968. How much pressure did you, aged 25, feel at the time? Let me put it this way. I was quite unusual. Now Formula One teams not only have a third driver, they have the fourth, fifth, the sixth and seventh driver. I think Colin was the first one that plonked me in the position as reserve driver. So I drove everything for Colin and tested everything for Colin with Graham, Jimmy as the main drivers. I did a Formula 2 season with Graham and really as far as Jimmy was concerned, I didn't have any real contact with him. I mean, he was always very, very pleasant and he, he talked to me a bit more about driving the car than Colin did. Colin not only lost his best friend, but he'd lost his best driver. So there wasn't pressure at Monte Carlo. There was more of jumping in the deep end without being taught how to swim properly. I'll give you an example. At the start of the race, Colin Chapman stuck his head in the cockpit. Uh, used to call me Lad. And said, Lad, in the whole history of Monte Carlo, never more than six cars had finished. What I should have done before I got in the car, sat me down and said, look, it's not important that you win this race because it's asking too much. You've done a reasonable job at qualifying mid-grid. Look after the car and you'll get a world championship point for yourself and the team. But Colin didn't do that. Nobody did it. And Jimmy wasn't around anymore. So it was more of a, a baptism of fire with a swimmer that was trying to learn and all he had was pump up armbands. And consequently, it, it didn't produce the result that I wanted. What it did do, it put me in a car that was the best Formula One car of its era. And my performance allowed me to drive for other Formula One teams subsequently. So it was a leg up. But looking back on it, I probably could have done better and there are examples of people being plunged in the deep end that have done better. Listen, I'm fascinated by so much of what you've just said. Can we just talk a little bit more about Jimmy, first of all? When you talk to him about the cars, how much detail did he go into? He didn't go into any detail because I wasn't competing against him like I was with Graham in Formula 2 season in 67. My first experience of Jimmy was when I was testing the Formula 3 car because in 66 I was driving Formula 3 cars for Colin in Charles Lucas' Team Lotus team. Jimmy on the way from Hethel stopped in to talk to Jim Enderwright, the team manager, who was running the Formula 3 team as well with the mechanics. A little bit of awe of him. He asked me about the car and then he turned around to Jim Enderwright and said, can I have a go? So... I stepped back, Jim took his shoes off, I think he had his helmet, and in shirt sleeves got in the car, and after four laps he was quicker than me. So I thought, hmm, I've got a bit to learn here, haven't I? Wow, what a fantastic talent he was. And that story about Chapman on the grid at Monaco, just putting a little bit of pressure on you, is that the environment that Chapman created at Lotus? Did he thrive on pressure and putting people under pressure? Is that, was that his modus operandi? Colin was a big effect on my life in two ways. One is he gave me a fantastic opportunity and I drove a lot of cars for him and a lot of testing, testing cars, which prepared me well for other teams that I ran to. But also he designed the car, ran the team, found the money. And I found myself in later life when I became became a team owner, I asked myself, what would Colin do now? And I wasn't capable of his technical ability, but I had some entrepreneurial skills that I think Colin had. When I jumped into Formula One, he said to me, lad, Formula One's only the important thing in racing. He would say that. He was a statement man, without filling in the gaps. 
And that's the way he was. I mean, I spent a huge amount of time at Hethel and I could see him charging around the drawing office with the board and the ruler and the pen, scribbling on the designer's drawing, saying, not like that, like this. You know, he was like that, you see. So he had a presence, urged people to do better, but there was no philosophy involved with his attack. Did he ever tell you how to drive the car? No. He drove. I mean, I went to Goodwood to test the Cortina that I drove when Jimmy wanted to do it. And Jimmy, he and Graham all got in the cars. And he was pretty quick in the Cortina. But driving a Cortina in the 1960s wasn't like driving a Formula One car in the 60s. So I don't think his skill would have gone to the point of single-seater racing. But he could race. What about the Lotus 49 then? What was it like to drive? Well, it was the start of aerodynamics. I think I was one of the first people to experience the change from a rear engine successful Formula One car with a wing on the back. Colin only, he didn't test it. He brought it to Rouen for the French Grand Prix because that's the way he was. Never tested the wings that snetted and everything like that. So I looked at the cars. Graham's had a wing that was low and mine was a bit higher. And I said to him, boy, and I pushed it laterally across the car because it had to stay this way. So it was stiff this way, but laterally across the car, I, I pushed it, it went wong, 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 wong. I just turned to him and went, hmm. He said, lad, when you're sitting on a 707, it's about to take off outside the windows, right? The aerodynamics are flexible so they don't break. So I said, OK, <laughs> fair enough. But there are examples, and I acted a Rouen in practice, on the straight, swapping from the inside to the outside of the circuit on the straight as I came up against uh, the BRM of Atwood. I don't know what happened, but I lost control of the car on the straight. And I think it fell over backwards because it did this and, you know, the, the struts that, that held it on, right, snapped and picked the rear of the car up and sent me into the chateau wall. Did you suggest that to Colin? And if you did, what did he say? Do you know what he said? He ran across, because it was obviously the pits, he ran across, looked at the back of the gearbox, torn off the back of the car, and said, did you hit anything? Right? Now, as a young driver, you're always concerned that you've made mistakes. So I, th- I thought, he thinks I've, I've hit something on the previous corner, Right, which has made the gearbox come off the back of the car. So I said, no. So he runs back to the pit, sticks his head in the cockpit of Bruce McLaren and said, these rear wings are pulling the gearboxes off the back of the engine. And then when it subsequently wasn't that, right, because someone came up to him and said, well, the car veered out of control along the straight as Jackie went to pass outward. He said, you told me you, you didn't hit anything. You did you hit the bloody chateau wall. You can't win. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. But that's the way it was. Look, you, you, you've got to bear in mind that Colin was a highly stressed individual. I mean, he, he lived on his nerves and the team was well stressed and he just lost his best driver. So you'd expect him to be a little bit more erratic than he normally would be. But he was a very talented individual, so you have to excuse him. I'll continue to pick Jackie's brains on his time at Lotus in just a minute. But if you're listening to this episode at the time of release, you'll know that the next stop on the Formula One calendar is at Sochi for the Russian Grand Prix. Privyet to all of our Russian listeners. I hope my pronunciation was okay there. I love that Grand Prix, everything about it, even my evening walks along the banks of the Black Sea. But it's a good job I've got a bit of time before I land in Sochi to work on my Russian, isn't it? And lucky for me, Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language in a fun and engaging way. The courses are designed with practical, real-world conversations in mind, which is exactly what I need. And their speech recognition technology will help me improve on my pronunciation and accent. And it can help you do the same too. Want to be fluent in French, great at German, or have a spin at learning Spanish? Babbel has 14 different languages to choose from, and you can learn at your own pace. It's available as an app or online, which is perfect if you find yourself trying to squeeze a lesson in on the go, and your progress will be synced across all your devices. 
And I definitely recommend checking out their new learning podcasts to give you that extra little boost too. So right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code GRID. Go to uk.babbel.com forward slash play and use the promo code GRID for an extra six months free. That's uk.babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash play, promo code GRID. Were you nervous about the fragility of the Lotus cars? Because even then they had a, had a reputation, didn't they? If you ask a driver, a competitive driver that is full of confidence and a little bit arrogant, you can rinse an example. If someone said to you, do you want a slower car that's safe or do you want one that's a little bit less safe but faster and can win? What do you think they would say? Even in those days when it was so much more dangerous, they would still say, give me the faster car that's more fragile. Well, do you know why I'm called Jackie? All my mates and everything, I was always Jack Oliver. The reasons why I was called Jackie is I got a press release when I took over from Jimmy at the Monte Carlo Grand Prix. And I said to Jim Enderwright, where's this Jackie came from? I'm Jack. He said, probably because Colin tried to buy Jackie Stewart out of Tyrrell and he wouldn't come. Do you, do you think he really did try and do that? <laughs> I know he did. Subsequently. Have you spoken to Jackie Stewart about it? Yeah. Well, I spoke to Helen, actually. Some years later, I said, Helen, did uh, Colin try to buy Jackie out of... She said, yes. I said, well, what happened? He said he didn't want to drive for the car, for Colin, because the cars were unsafe. OK, so he was very aware of it. How did you personally deal with the dangers back in those days? I didn't stop. It tells you everything you need to know. But before a wet spa, did you think about it at all? I get asked this question all the time with young people that suddenly realise I used to be a race driver. And... Um, it was never an issue because it was always going to happen to somebody else. And even after your fiery crash at Harama in 1970 or your massive Can-Am accident at mont blanc the same year, having witnessed Jochen Rint dying, Joseph Hurt dying at Brands Hatch, Francois Sever at Watkins Glen, throughout all of that, your attitude never changed. It changed after I was... I went to the United States and together with Don Nichols told him how to run a racing team by building the cars in the UK. So I transferred Shadow to Northampton, hired all the people. I was partly responsible for the UOP sponsorship. And John Logan then, I said, you should do Formula One because your business is international because I want to get back into Formula One. So I drove the first shadow Formula One car of the team I put together with Alan Reese and all the mechanics. But in doing so, I was putting a team together and driving the cars, both in the States and in Europe, going backwards between Europe and living in the United States. It was pulling me apart. What was pulling you apart? The, the, the travel and the stress of all of that was pulling you apart? Driving and... and and putting a team together in that manner was too much, especially for family life. And it wrecked the family life. So I wanted to just concentrate on one series. But John Logan didn't want me to do that. He said, Jackie, if you're going to cut back your driving activity, I want you to try and win the Can-Am Championship in the USA. It's a decision I regret, but I had to make a choice. And I bowed to that. And I did win the championship. Probably better because was I good enough to win the world championship with the shadow car? Probably not. I mean, they are, they, they, as far as status are concerned, they are hugely different. All you can do is deal with the pressures at the time and the opportunities at the time. And when it came to Euro P stopping and Don quite rightly wanted to move the operation back to the USA and concentrated on USA racing because he wanted to live in the United States. I had the decision of whether I should continue driving or help Don find the money to keep the Formula One team going in Northampton. So I suddenly I found I was looking for money for the team. We, I, Ambrosio, mad, crazy 
Italian and a uh, tobacco company from Switzerland. I, I was not only had put the team together, now I was helping Don find the money. I was also driving the cars when we couldn't find drivers in Formula One to do it. And the first race in, um, I think it was 77, because I spoke a bit of Italian and had to look after Franco, Franco didn't get on with Don Nichols so well. I went to the South African Grand Prix and witnessed the accident of Tom Price and went to the hospital afterwards and saw what had happened to him. And there you come to another stage in your life where you're never having to do that and you see that. And I say, I've got to stop getting behind the wheel here. I drove the car until we got Alan Jones to come over and take over from Tom Price. But it's, it's those eye-witnessing experiences that should drive you to stop. Interestingly enough, in, in stopping, I had to decide what I was going to do instead. And that's when you, you became a team boss. I've got loads more questions about your driving career. And can we just reflect on the end of that 1968 season? You led convincingly at Brands Hatch. You then get on the podium in Mexico. Was there talk about you staying at Lotus for 69 at that point? Colin didn't want to lose me, but he wanted a different type of driver. I looked up to Colin. Colin didn't want that. He wanted something and looked down at him and saying, this car's not quick enough, I want it better. And if you don't make it better, I'll go somewhere else. See, when I first met Colin, he signed me up in 66. I kept on calling him Sir. Right? He says, don't call me Sir. My name's Colin. So I was the wrong fit for him. Someone like Jochen Rin was a perfect fit for Colin. He wanted someone to do what he couldn't do and give the information forcefully about how to make the car better, which, without the technology they have now, was the guy that was sitting in the seat. And I didn't do that because I was so enamoured by the fact that I was driving for Lotus. How tough was it for you to move on from Lotus? It wasn't tough because after the British Grand Prix, Stanley came up and offered me a huge amount of money for drive for him next year. And, and did you bite his hand off? Or? Well, I said, yes. At that age, you're very instinctive. If I could go back, I'd probably back, go back to Colin and say, look, I've got an offer to go somewhere else. Can I stay here? And if so, what? But hindsight's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and when I went to BRM, I started to realise that this subservient attitude I had with Colin right, was wrong. And funnily enough, directly complaining about certain things to Stanley in the second season, when I got Tony Southgate, well, um, it was, it was um, John Surtees that got Tony in. But as soon as I got Tony, I started with what Tony wanted to do with the car and not do with the car, and with, it, with the team manager, uh, who was Parnell, I went forcefully to Stanley and said, we've got to change things, it's no good. And by moaning, do you think they respected you more? No, Stanley didn't. Stanley wanted someone that was compliant, which wasn't Colin, but was Stanley. So when I started to complain about certain people and the way things should be done, he thought I was losing confidence in the team and I had to find somebody else. Well, why are you losing confidence in the team? Because you had just four finishes in two years with BRM. How demotivating was that? Well, you've just said the reasons why. It was awful. Car was quick at some places. I should have won some races. Jackie, let's talk Austria 1970. Louis Stanley went on record after the race saying he thought you could have won that one and you, what, you finished fifth, I think. At Brands Hatch, I blew Pedro into the weeds. At Spa, he blew me into the weeds. The trouble is with Pedro and Stanley, he was a much nicer person than me. And also, he was quick. <laughs> I was a bit arrogant Essex boy. It didn't go down well with Stanley. That's the way Formula One was now. I suspect it's a bit like that. It's a personality now in Formula One. I mean, George is quick and he's got a fantastic personality and it's helping him. Jackie, we'll come on to, to current day stuff, but just how do you reflect on that 1970 race? Do you agree with Louis Stanley that it was one that got away? Some drivers are not circuit dependent. Others are, and it's to do with confidence levels. There's some drivers that believe they're better in the wet, and because they think they are, they are. Maybe I was one of them. Spa, 
Not my forte. Street circuits. Monte Carlo is not my forte. Stick me in Monza or Brands Hatch, San Javit or Canadian Grand Prix track. Tracks that I'd raced at before for a second and a third time were my forte. That Spa was not. And I think Pedro blew me into the weeds at Spa. At Brands Hatch when we went there for the Grand Prix, I was on the second row, Pedro was on the back. It happens. Why were you so good at tracks like Brands Hatch? What was it? Is it, a, is it something to do with the corners, the constant radius corners that you get at Brands? Or is it just a familiarity thing? I really don't know. That, that's, it's too difficult for me to analyse because I didn't do it on purpose. I don't really know. Well, you say you were good in the wet. Let's talk Canada 73. The lap charts, well, I was going to say the lap charts say you finished third, but because of the rain and a little bit of confusion, there are still to this day people who think you won that Grand Prix. Well, the reasons why I know I did is that we had an, a, an elderly couple that used to do all the lap charts for all the races in the United States, and they were very proficient. I think his name was Tony. I said, Tony said to me, you won that race. I'd put my house on the bet because my lap charts are always right. And Revson was a lap behind, which they never counted. I don't know about Fittipaldi. Did you ever speak to Peter Revson about it? Yeah, sure. What, what did he say? Peter drove for Shadow. Unfortunately, he didn't make it all the way because the uh, front suspension failure at the test at, at Silverstone. So they wanted an American driver in the car and didn't want former anymore. And I said, well, you should talk to Peter because I think he's the right image for you. I was hoping I was going to do the Formula One with him, but I never did for the reasons I gave earlier. I couldn't do, I couldn't do everything. So I did talk to him about it. Redfern's a great guy. I liked him very much. It was good fun to be with. We had some great fun in New York City together many times. But of course, you can imagine what he'd say. He's not going to turn around and say, yeah. But, because, I mean, Pete didn't know he'd lost a lap. He, doesn't know, he didn't know how long he was in the pits. He'd never think of it that way when it came to changing tyres. So he's going to say, well, they said I won, Jackie, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> so look, Jackie, it was the, the driving bit for you was 50 starts. It was four teams. Where were you happiest and when were you at your peak? I can't answer the question. The reasons why you can't answer the question is you don't know. You only know when you get in the car that can win or a car that's as good as many others or which has been driven by the best drivers in the world. It's a comparison. You've got, you've got, no, other, you've got no other measure. I, I'll give you an example. James Hunt and Tom Price were two guys that had fantastic car control. And they both drove the same car as me in the United States, Formula 5000 and Can-Am. And I beat them hands down because they'd only been in the car for the first time when they raced with me. I said to Don, you either want to run one car for me, but if you want to run two car team, get a driver that tests the car and starts with me in the season. Otherwise, there's no comparison. Well, the Formula 5000 car at Long Beach... I don't know how it happened, but it's, Tom was going to drive the second car at a street circuit. And he was doing pretty well in the Formula One car for Shadow. And he was three seconds a lap slower than me in the first instance. And he managed to claw it back to about two seconds a lap. And I said to Alan, I said, Alan said, what do you think? I said, I said, Alan, you know why? And he said, yeah, because he's not used to the car. I said, well, there you go. But tell Don that. It's not, it's an unfair. So the question, when am I at my peak? I could say I was at a peak when I drove against James Hansen, but it's an unfair comparison. Is that where sports car racing is so good? Because you won many sports car races, but let's talk specifically about Le Mans in 69, your win in the GT40. Your teammates with Jackie X, you are driving the exact same car. So is that the only time in your career that you actually get a proper comparison with another driver. The GT40 at Sebring, after the race, John Horsman came up to and said, we couldn't have won the race without you. So presumably he's got all the timesheets. So he saw the stints was the difference between first and second place if you had all the numbers up. With Pedro at Le Mans, 
in the Langhek 917. I've still got the lap record for the May test at 3 minutes 13.4. Pole position at 113.94. Fastest lap in the race, 114.4. All the time I was in the car. Now Pedro at, the, at Spa blew me to pieces. So again, at the peak of my career at Le Mans, and not at Spa. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've got no idea. Yeah. How, how important was that win at Le Mans for you personally? It's important for the audience. Because someone said to me, what's your favourite race? Finished in second behind Jochen Rint in Hockenheim in a Formula 2 car. Anything else? Winning Le Mans with Jackie Hicks. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> because they'd heard of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is so true. I mean, I would have won that race with Jochen Rint, but he passed me on the grass on the last lap because of all the slipstreaming. How he got away with it, I do not know. He came off the grass almost bloody sideways, and if I hadn't have backed out, we would have had a mighty big shunt. But that was Jochen. He didn't care. He was unbelievable. I mean, he was such an arrogant bastard. <laughs> well, look, while we're talking other drivers, who was the best F1 driver you ever raced? Jackie Stewart. What was so special? Jackie used to astound me for two reasons. His ability on the first lap just blows your mind away. Where he can find the smoothness and the pace to do what he... He's got to be on the front row, of course, which has you know, got to do with him and the car. And his ability to this day in which to inquire on grounds of safety. The first thing that Jackie Stewart did when I joined the GPDA was send me to all the circuits to say whether they were safe or not. What's a young guy from Essex that's just come into Formula 1 know about circuit safety? I move the, that arm code back and put something there and do that. I mean, that's straight off the top of my head. When it came to looking at the safety in cars and the potential of a driver dying because of circuit safety and things that were not right with the car, Stuart used to go and find out. He used to go along and find out what the driver's injuries were, what killed them, etc., etc. I'd never do that. And people asked me, well, why didn't you? I said, well, I was worried, perhaps, subliminally, that it would affect my performance. It did with the example with Tom Price, for example made me stop. But Jackie went to do it and did a fantastic job and was instrumental in increasing safety along with Stanley's input with medical cover. And it didn't harm his performance. But you did have a little protest before the start at Le Mans, yourself and Jackie X, didn't you, in 69? Oh, Jackie did. I mean, I had two teammates in World Sports Car Championship, one a bit difficult and one fantastic. I mean, I got on so well with Pedro. Pedro was instrumental in getting me back to JW Automotive after we shared the team together at BIM in 1970. And the reasons why, because Kinnan wasn't fast enough in the GT40, so he wanted a quicker driver. And I've been told by David York that Pedro asked for me. He was the best teammate I ever had. Jackie X was quick, an all-round better driver than me, looking back on it. But boy, there was only one person in the team as far as he was concerned, and that was him. How frustrated were you when you saw him walk across the track to his car prior to the start in 69? You lost a whole stack of places as a result. His little protest saying that it was too old fashioned, too dangerous to be running across the track. And you're sitting, you must have been sitting there going, come on, we want to win this race. There are only two things that came out of that in the situation with Jackie is his protest got rid of that stupid Le Mans Asselon start. And the second good thing, it, was, it made the closest finish ever in Le Mans history. But apart from that, I can't think of anything else that I would have recommended it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? There was, I think, 100 metres uh, between first and second, weren't there? Well, look, Jackie, that's part one of your career. Let's come on to part two now. And of course, Arrows. When did you first have the idea of becoming an F1 team entrant? I know exactly why, because uh, 
things that were happening that were starting to make me decide that I should do something different. One is that the phone wasn't ringing anymore. So that tells you the doors are closing. So no one was calling me up, particularly when I drove the shadow at the Swedish Grand Prix, was the last Formula One race I did, and did pretty well. So people were on the plane going back. People were playing, you did very well. You know, they say, you haven't driven Formula One for ages, you come here, you haven't driven for a while, you jump in that car and you end up seventh and pass Nicky Lauda, who was winning the, leading the championship. So that gives you an example that no one offered me to drive anything after that performance. So I was thinking, I'm not sure I want to drive anymore and I'm not going to do what other people do, is go down the formula and stay in the business that nobody wants me to be in anymore. It didn't appeal to me. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was also helped putting the shadow team together. I haven't told people, many of people this story. I knew Don was going to take the team back to the United States and some of the employees in Northampton were saying to me, what's going to happen, Jackie? Particularly Alan Reese. I want to stay doing it. I don't know whether Don does. So I spoke to Don. Don, you haven't paid me for my driving career for the last 18 months, driving stints for the last 18 months. I think you're going to take the team back to the United States and I want it to stay here. Do you want to sell me the team? Now, the reasons why I asked that is because Ambrosio says to me, you seem to drive the cars, look after me and running the team, including all the people in Northampton. If you were going to do something on your own, I'll back you. So I had a reason to do it. As it so happened, it didn't happen that way. There were reasons why it didn't happen that way. Bernie knew what I was doing and he said, I know what you're up to, Oliver, which was his way of saying, can I help you? <laughs> you've, got, you've got to understand what, how Bernie works. Right? And he said, when's Don next in the UK? So I said, I think next week, just after the Italian Grand Prix. He said, I want to get you two together. I think he was going to do one of those head-banging sessions. Right? He, he didn't want to lose what I was going to do, and he thought it was highly risky, so he might not even get it off the ground. And he didn't want the shadow to go away. So he was going to see whether he could... Because that's the way he did. I mean, he was a ringmeister, wasn't he? As it so happened, something else happened in Northampton that really upset Don. So he never went to the meeting with Bernie. What upset him? Um, I think I prefer not to say, but it was someone in the organisation that was not behaving themselves properly and did something that they shouldn't have done. And uh, Don got to hear about it, and I think there was a big, a big fuss. It wasn't going to work, right? regardless of whether, whether it was that incident that made Don decide not to do it. I don't think Don wanted to do that anyway. I think he wanted to keep the team and go back to the States and build the car there. I don't, I've got no idea. But so what it prompted me to do was to say to him, well, you pay me, which he did, and he kept the house. And I taught the kids. The kids being all the employees, yeah. So what happens next? And why did you get into bed with Franco Ambrosio, Alan Rees, Dave Was, Tony Southgate? Why did you pull it together like that? Well, I needed, Tony was the last one to come. Alan took all the team down the pub uh, one Saturday. He said, Jackie's bought a factory in Milton Keynes. Anybody who wants to come has got to give their notice in. And they all came except Tony and the lorry driver. <laughs> because they knew if they didn't, they were worried that Don was going to take the team back to the United States, asking them to come over and build the car there. And most of them yeah. didn't want to do it. They, their allegiance was with me and Alan Rees. So, so that's what happened. <laughs> I guess you felt obliged to do it then. <laughs> and they all handed their notice in. Right? So I said, Tony, you're going to come. He said, you're never, ever going to get away with it. You're out of your bloody mind. It's too risky. But of course, when he went in two weeks later, in the Monday morning after two weeks of the laps, and he went into the factory, he called me up and he said, there's only Bob here, the lorry driver. That offer of job's still open. So I said, yeah. But of course, the big mistake he made, he took the bloody drawings he was doing for Shadow with him. And that, of course, caused the court case. 
I said, what'd you do that for? He said, they're mine. Unfortunately, the copyright lawyer looked at it and said, no, the intellectual property rights belong to the person that was paying to do the job, Mr Southgate. Jackie, it is an incredible story. You decide to set up your own Formula One team. And then before you've even got started, this is the original Spygate we're talking about here, because you were accused of the first Arrows being a copy of the Shadow DN9, weren't you? Well, it was, because Tony shouldn't have taken the drawings with him. Don is a pretty capable individual. I've seen him since, and he said, Jackie, I couldn't have done it without you. No remorse at all. But it was a bit tough. I said, well, we're in a tough business. Perhaps you should have given me some of the shares in the company and I wouldn't have gone away, but you didn't. Anyway, so Don and I were okay. And it is a tough business. The problem is, is that Tony had all the ideas in his head. He didn't need to take the role of drawings. But when the two cars appeared, they looked so similar that Don said, I'm going to get back at you guys. So he had an Anton Pillar order, which is to do with the fashion industry. So suddenly, unknown to me, in early January 78, the bailiff turned up to search the place. So Alan called me and said, I said, well, let him in. You know, I let him in, going through the filing cabinets and all that. And then 12 shadow joys came out from behind Tony Southgate's desk. Wham! I said, what are you doing with those? He said, they're mine. But the trouble is that the council we hired eventually said, no, Mr Southgate, they're not. At any point in all of this, Jackie, did you think, do you know what, I've bitten off more than I can chew. Uh, why don't we just go and do something else? Because suddenly you're right up against it, aren't you, in terms of getting a car made in time for the start of the 78 season? It's the same example I gave you before. You know, you, either the risks of driving the car get too great for you, you stop. Or in the example like that, I said, Tony, that was pretty stupid. He said, well, what do you want to do about it? And I said to Alan Reese, you know, there's some things that went on in the shadow factory in Northampton that Don wasn't too happy about. What do you want to do about it? And they turned around to me and said, well, what do you want to do about it? So I said, nothing. He said, OK, let's sort the problem out. So they got their heads down and built the 50-day car. Do you know why it was called the 50-day car? Go on. Because the copyright lawyer when we were in the office and he spoke to Tony Southgate and said, no. I turned around to Alan and said, how long, how long can you hold up the case for? Right. So I turned to Alan and I said, to change the bits that are in breach, how long is it going to take? He said, 60 or 70 days. And the lawyer turned around to me and said, I could hold it up for 50 days. So we did it in 50 days. And we did it by the skin of our teeth. We lost the case and turned up with a different car, only the shape of it, different car for the Dutch Grand Prix. Make a good movie, wouldn't it? It would make an incredible movie. And, and the amazing thing is that the car was decent straight out of the box, wasn't it? The first one was better than the second one, yeah. When you look back at the whole Arrows era, actually, I've got one very basic question to ask you. It's Arrows, A R R O W S. Who is the second R? I've never been able to work it out. Nobody. Okay. A friend's wife, who was very good at those things, she said, Pete and um, her husband, Pete, said, are you going to start your own team? What are you going to call it? An Oliver? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, because of Colin Chapman. It was never called a Chapman. It was called a Lotus. So his wife said, why don't we do an anagram? So who's involved? I said, well, there's Ambrosio. There's Reese, there's Wasps, there's Oliver, the Southgate. So she came up with arrows, but with one R. So she's why don't put another R in there because then it, it's arrows, Fletcher in Italian, right? Which would be a put. And, and I thought, that is a good name for a race car. That's so happy. So that's why it became an arrows. It's because of Colin again. What were the strengths and weaknesses of each of your partners? If I take you through one by one, Franco Ambrosio, Italian financier, what were his greatest strengths? Money and enthusiasm. Alan Reese, Great team manager. The thing that really impressed me about Alan was the uh, Formula 2 car, Winkham and Formula 2 car. 
I mean, he put that together with Rin. And he also drove the car. It wasn't a bad driver. It wasn't a quick driver. But his professionalism in putting that together and running it, I thought, I've got to get him. Dave Wass? Dave Wass, engineering for Gearbox. I was familiar with his work. And Southgate, of course, had been the designer at BRM. So he knew me, and I was going to drive the Formula One car. So he, he came because he wanted to work with me, and I wanted to work with him. Although he was the la- he was last to arrive. What did Jackie Oliver bring to the party? What was your greatest strength in that capacity? As it turned out, I'm a door opener. I was able, with my personality, to convince people to follow me. And with a good team around me, of the engineers and people that you've just mentioned, the combination of that was enough to actually just to, with what we had, in which to build a good car quickly and survive in a very difficult business where lots of teams in the 70s were coming and going. If you look at the number of teams that, that came and went in the 70s and early 80s, there was 20 of them, including Lotus. So I'm a survivor, I suppose. Now, on paper, the team's best season was 1988 when you finished fourth. When do you think you had the most competitive car? Most competitive car was the A3 with Patrese. The car was quick. Patrese was quick. Michelin tyres changed it completely. We had the best car with, on Michelin tyres, but the teams that had Michelins persuaded Michelins to withdraw the tyres from me. So the performance went out the window. That's very frustrating. Well, it's happened many times in my career. You know, when I got Alan Jenkins, we were the first people, person, in Milton Keynes I built a wind tunnel, 40% scale wind tunnel. And Jenkins built the best car in Formula One. And we were quick at the early part of that season with that car. Because with the wind tunnel, we found out that when you made a ground effect car, the point of pressure went forward. And you, could, you had to move the driver forward and a lot of other things. So the weight distribution of the car was perfect. But as soon as we had the accidents, they got together and said, we've got to slow the cars down because they're unsafe. And Ferrari saw how good our car was aerodynamically. And they said, slow the cars by cutting the thing in the back of the gearbox. And it completely destroyed the balance of the car because it went back. The aerodynamic balance went back and all our weight was forward, so it understeered like a pig. Now let's talk about the 1987 car, the A10, or more specifically, its designer, because it was penned by Ross Braun. Jackie, how do you reflect on his time at the team? Neil Oakley, I was trying to get Neil. Ross was in the wind tunnel at Beatrice. Neil was one of the designers, and Neil told him, call Jackie, he's looking for, because I've decided to do something else. The phone rang. I said, there's a guy called Ross Bourne. I said, don't know him. When well, he says he wants to talk to you. So I talk to anybody. So Ross came on the phone and he said, you understand you're looking for a designer. So I said, why are you interested? He said, well, the designer I'm working for in the wind tunnel says you are. So he's told you to call me, has he? So he said, yes. So he's going to go to McLaren then, is he? I wouldn't know, but it looks like it. So you're looking for a designer. I said, we well, better come and see me. That's how it happened. And I tell you what, Russ turned out to be the best designer I've ever had. I mean, he's, the trouble is, he said to me, I've often said, why did you leave? He said, because you hadn't got enough money to do what I wanted to do, Jackie. So fair enough. True. What was Ross's greatest quality? The ability to be able to manage very effectively the whole group of people that were in the design office. And he proved to do that throughout his whole career, particularly at Ferrari. His design management for the whole design team, and the bigger the team of designers became, the better he got at it. And that's his strength. Let's talk drivers. Who was the best driver to race for Arrows? The best all-round one was Derek Warwick. And the best one as far as personality and ability was Gerhard Berger. It's great to hear Jackie's F1 story on Beyond the Grid. And he also features in an episode of our documentary podcast, F1 On The Edge. It's the remarkable story of the 1982 South African Grand Prix, when the drivers 
refused to drive and they went on strike. Jackie was right in the thick of the action and so was the driver he's just mentioned, Derek Warwick. You'll hear them both on F1 on the Edge, Drivers on Strike. And you can listen for free on Spotify. There are other incredible F1 stories in the series too, all told by the drivers, team bosses, mechanics, reporters and fans who witness them. You'll hear the mystery of the $300,000 diamond that went missing during the 2004 Monaco Grand Prix. Plus, an exclusive, previously unheard recording of a furious Ayrton Senna, who was enraged by the upstart rookie Eddie Irvine at Suzuka in 1993. And a breathtaking drama from Formula One's early days, when legendary champion Juan Manuel Fangio was kidnapped at gunpoint on the eve of a tragic race in Cuba. F1 on the Edge tells these incredible stories and more like never before. With interviews from the likes of Mika Hakkinen, Jacques Villeneuve, David Coulthard, Damon Hill, Martin Brundle and Ross Braun. All seven episodes are available right now, perfect listening for a race-free week. You can listen for free exclusively on Spotify and you don't need a subscription. Just download the app and search for F1 on the Edge. Now let's get back to our chat with Jackie and how Bernie Eccleston helped his Arrows team survive. The reasons why I did a joint venture with uh, Tom Walkinshaw was because I bought the team back from Ohashi footwork. And be quite honest with you, the money I had to find was just impossible. I was pouring all the money I'd made in life back in in those two years to keep the company alive. And I said to Bernie, I'm not going to finish the season. I'm going to go bust. He said, you got anybody in mind? Oliver, you're asking me to help? Since you've been doing this, you've never won a race. You want me to pitch something for you on that CV? Never won any race. So I said, OK, I suppose that's an answer, Bernie. So I'll think about it. And he came back with Tom Walkinshaw. He said, he's exactly what you need because I know you're not very happy about doing it and he wants control, but you have never won anything and he's won loads of things. So he's just what you need. I said, Bernie, you're doing that because Tom's about to fall out with Flavio and at Ligier, a Scotsman trying to run a, a team run by a lot of Frenchmen, is obviously, I hear, causing lots of problems. And I'm about to go out of the bus, so you're putting two dead cats together to make a live one. He said, do you want to do it or not? I said, I've got no choice, have I? He said, you'll be all right. You need Tom. I spoke to him, he said, I said, what do you hell think went wrong with Tom? Everything he touched was gold until he got into Formula One and then it was a disaster. <laughs> Total disaster. We never fell out. We never fell out. <laughs> Oh, uh, what was it? What was it? Um, Duckworth said to me when it was about to go belly up because Tom wasn't paying for the engines, if you remember right at that time, by the time I'd gone out. He said, Oliver, he said, we all thought that Tom was going to kill you. Instead of that, you've sold your Formula One team three times. How'd you do that? I said, I don't know. No idea, Keith. He said, Bloody amazing. We're all, we're all going, how did he do that? You're such a wheeler dealer, Jackie, just like Bernie. But with Tom Walkinshaw comes Damon Hill. You have the reigning world champion joining your team for 97. You must have been very confident going into that year. You can see by talking to me, Tom, I'm a very pragmatic person. There are five things in Formula One that you have to have in which to win the world championship. You can get lucky and do it with four, but you can't do it with just one or two. Tom had more, he had, he had enough money, borrowed most of it, but he was willing to spend enough money. And he had Damon. He didn't have anything else. Didn't have an engine, didn't have a designer. So I said this to Tom, I said, you're fine. You know, Damon, lovely guy, he gets up, but it's not enough. You've, got, you've just got one of five things you need. I mean, Dern is not your answer. Stay with the car that, that, that I had last year with Verstappen and people. It's a good car and, until we can sort the rest of it out. But if you dive into the deep end with giving Dern a new thing and a Yamaha engine, I mean, it's not going to work. Still, you came 
within three laps of winning a Grand Prix that year in Hungary. And with Damon Hill on his 75th lap, let's go back to Louise Goodman to see how things are in the arrows. Go They're on. not going very well, I'm afraid, Murray. Damon's just come on the radio to say that he's having a problem with his throttle. It's not backing off properly. Oh, no. I don't think he's going to make it. I don't think he's going to be fast enough on the last lap. He's losing so much time. Fjordov's going to take the lead. Fjordov is going to win the Hungarian Grand Prix. As it was, Damon finished second. No, that was because we were the only guy at Bridgestone supplied a tyre that was perfectly suited to do the distance at the go-kart track at Hungary. Everybody else's tyres were all shot. If we'd have won that race, it was only because of the tyres. How disappointed were you when it didn't happen? After however many hundred races, without that win, the one that Bernie had been talking to you about only the previous year, and to get so close? Well, of course, one victory would have been better than none. But during Arrow's history, there were a few occasions, Long Beach with Ricardo, Swedish race with Ricardo when the fan car won and then was banned afterwards. There were few and far between, but they were them. But that's the difference, isn't it? You see, I mean, there's lots of examples of people that won one race or two. But the successful drivers win many, and some win enough to win a championship. You must be the only man in history who has worked with both Graham Hill when you were teammates at Lotus in 68, and again Damon Hill in 97 when you were his boss. Do you see many similarities between those two? I said to Dan, I see Damon quite often, he comes here for supper, and he was promoting Jos a few years back. And I was really hoping that Jos would have gone on to be better than he was, because then we would have had three. But I think probably it was asking too much. I mean, I, I can still, I remember going to the house in Mill Hill and there was Damon, the little pedal car in the kitchen. And like his dad, he was uh, an unlikely world champion, but he had what his dad had determination, particularly in later life, and this to be able to manage itself. That wet race in Suzuka just shows the steel that he can muster from his DNA in which to fend off the most successful other race driver in Schumacher. I mean, he won a championship against Schumacher in a car that was good, but I think that's endorsement enough, isn't it? I'm going to ask you a very unfair question now, but who was quicker, Graham or Damon, do you think? I often get asked, and I say, you do as well and everybody else, who's the best driver? And there's absolutely no way you can actually say that because people will say, Fanjo, they will say, Jimmy, they will say, Nigel Mansell, different strokes for different folks. But here's the thing, Jackie, you know both of those hills intimately you know you know exactly how graham hill drove that car you know exactly how damon hill drove that arrows you cannot come up with the best driver in the world over a span of a period where so many things changed i tell you if someone asked me now to drive a modern formula one car and push all those buttons and speak to people on the radio and work out tyre strategy in one thing or another, my head would explode. Unless I grew up understanding such technology and how to encompass it, you had no chance. My natural skill set that I had at the time would serve me well in modern day racing, but the way in which you have to run the cockpit to be successful and the media afterwards, it's a different type of person. So it's impossible to, to make that judgment. It's different. Well, Jackie, if I were to describe Damon as very quick-witted and a man capable of seizing every opportunity given to him, how would you describe Graham Hill? They both worked very hard at overcoming any difficulties they were experiencing in doing the job. There's a few examples in modern day racing now. Uh, uh, Perez is one. Personality and perseverance. 
Was Graham a generous teammate to you? Did he help you? Did he give you advice, given that it was your first full season? The help was not directly. It was the comfort that I was his teammate and sharing everything with me. There are some drivers that are very competitive with their teammate out of the car. Graham was never that way, even when I was in front of him. Jackie, we've had the most wonderful chat. Thank you very much for your time. Last one from me is, when you look back at it all now, is there anything that you would have done differently? I'm very, very, was very, very friendly and still am very friendly with Von Dennis. We competed against each other in Formula One as team owners. He was my best man at my marriage. He still is my best mate, but I see him on a regular basis. He possesses one characteristic that I'm very envious of. He never looks back. He always looks forward. And quite honest with you, you can't change the past as much as you would like to. One always wishes that it could have been better than it was. But there's absolutely no point in looking back because there's nothing you can do about it. The statistics stand for themselves and the stories sometimes make up for it a bit, which is what we have done today, Tom. Oh, Jackie, so many wonderful stories. Thank you very much for your time. Go and have a cup of tea now, can't you? Okay. <laughs> yes. He sold his Formula One team three times. Bernie Ecclestone would be proud of you, Jackie. And what a fascinating look back at a hugely varied and fascinating career. Jackie's description of Rouen in 1968, when he crashed while trying the high rear wing on the Lotus 49, left me with chills. Drivers back then had a different relationship with their own mortality, didn't they? As for the original Spygate story with Arrows, just wow. And it says a lot about Jackie that he stuck at it and produced his 50-day car. Lesser men would have walked away. Jackie, many thanks for your time. It was great to chat and I hope to see you again soon. As ever, please remember to send in any stories or thoughts that you have on Jackie and I'll read out the best ones next week. Send them to me at Tom Clarkson F1 or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Derek Hill's reflections of his world champion father, Phil, after last week's show. And I'm delighted to report that many of you enjoyed the episode, with a number of you commenting on how much you enjoyed hearing an American accent on the show. Well, let's start with this one from Matteo Guasco, who says, I got goosebumps and tears just because of the sound of the Ferrari 156. So much respect for those drivers and Phil Hill Thanks for the tale. It's a beautiful sound, isn't it, Matteo? So pure. Thanks for getting in touch. Then how about this from David Everson? Loved your latest podcast with Derek Hill. It was a fantastic insight into his father, Phil, and a great lead into the Italian Grand Prix. Thank you. Well, thanks, David. And yes, Derek told the story beautifully, didn't he? And I love this message from Adrian Nolan. Half the battle was not to kill yourself, and my father succeeded, says Adrian, quoting a line from Derek. Another fantastic interview with stunning insights. Well, thanks, Adrian. Can you just imagine doing a job in which your first task, before anything else, was not to kill yourself? How times have changed, thank goodness. And how about this from Tom Wade, who says, this week's Beyond the Grid episode with Derek Hill was absolutely incredible up there with the best ones, way before my time, but hearing the stories of years past is unbelievably inspiring. Great work as always. Well, thank you, Tom. And I agree, Phil's story is unbelievably inspiring. He moved to a different continent to pursue his dream and he succeeded. And we'll end with this little story from Big Ray. I was lucky to meet Phil in 1990 at Hill and Vaughan. I was standing out front chatting to staff when a shiny new Lexus came tearing into the parking lot and skidded to a stop, gravel flying. Out jumps Phil, grinning as he relates how he passed a Corvette on the freeway off-ramp. What a legend. Well, thanks for that, Big Ray. That was Phil Hill. As ever, I could read out lots more messages, but we'll leave it there for now. And thanks to everyone who wrote in. It was lovely to hear from you. 
Well, that's it for another week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Jackie Oliver and don't forget to send in your thoughts and stories on him. And as ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>